Welcome back, everyone. Uh, today we have another episode of Harry's Take, episode four, and I'm thrilled to be with Lauren Braun Costello, world renowned chef. Welcome. Hi, Harry. Thanks for having me. You have a big media presence, your public presence. So, can you give the viewers a little overview of what projects you have been a part of, whether that may be on TV or like cookbooks or or television appearances or whatnot? Sure. I have, I, you know, my presence um, is uh, spread out over the years um, in different media. I have uh, been a part of three books. I've published three books. Um, I've done uh, a lot of TV work behind the scenes for other chefs. I've done work for myself on camera. Um, I had a show on AOL um, years ago, sort of uh, at the beginning of all of this stuff, um, called Pantry Challenge. And that was a great show. Um, they had eight different chefs and they were all famous chefs. And then me, it was really funny um, and really uh, flattering. Um, and I got to have a show where we went into people's homes and uh, help them uh, make food for their kids taste better. Um, and get their kids to eat things they didn't want to eat um, by going and using things in their pantry. And that was on AOL. Um, and lots of people saw that show online. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I've done some, I've been in a lot of magazines and newspapers. Um, I've been on the news a lot, done a lot of news segments. I've been on The View. I've had, I've done a, it's just, I've got a lot of, and some local stuff, local news in New York, local news in Connecticut. Um, it's kind of been a bit of everything. Yeah, that's great. So what sparked your love for cooking before you became a chef? So it was always, food was always a really important part of our family. Um, growing up in New York, growing up on the Upper East Side, um, traveling a lot around the world, spending summers in East Hampton. I had a very lucky, privileged upbringing in that respect with like great sophistication and entertaining and access to food and culture and arts and all that stuff, restaurants. And it was always um, important. And entertaining was a big part of our family life, too, a very important part of our family life. And my family entertained very formally, actually. Um, there was a lot of help around in the house to help execute that. And uh, it happened often. And I spent a lot of times, you know, tugging at the apron strings of the people who were doing that, um, whether it was my mother and grandparents doing some of the food preparation or professionals doing it, um, mm -hmm. people helping to do the service and everything. And that really kind of from day one, always, uh, you know, had, I was, the interest was uh, there from day one. It was always sparked in me. And it was all, I was always made to understand that it's important that food is um, a big part of showing love, part of experiencing joy, something people can share um, that's mm -hmm. globally interesting. Um, and uh, I've, you know, never, never disagreed with that point of view. Uh, we spent every meal talking about what we we're going to eat on the next meal, in particular for <laughs> vacation. I'm sure if you've experienced that before, you're at dinner at a great resort and you're like, what are we going to do for lunch tomorrow? You know, breakfast yeah. is breakfast, but what are we going to do for lunch? Um, yeah. So we, it was kind of, that was always part of my upbringing. Yeah. It's, I know that you, I've actually, I'm lucky to say that I've been a guest at your entertainment and it's, been always been fabulous food thank you food. harry yeah i just like it it heightens the the company i feel like it enhances a lot of the function if you will yeah the food's a big part of it i agree so when you talked about the cookbooks what was it like to write a book and go through the publishing process did you have uh, professionals help you or what was that like the great question. It's a big question because I've done it a couple different ways and they're very different with their pros and cons. Um, I had an agent um, for what turned out to be my first and second book were almost in tandem. So it wasn't like one was a year or two before the other. I kind of got two book deals, no exaggeration, within about 10 days of each other. Um, and the first one was more traditional with a an agent and a publishing company. And the second one was I was approached by the publisher who's a self-publisher and became my co-author to do the book with me. He was a student in one of my cooking classes, actually. Um, and he had been looking for someone, a chef, to write this book that was Notes on Cooking. 
Um, and so that was a self-published journey. And then the third one was I was um, I contributed the recipes to a children's book, and that author was uh, an alumna of the same college I went to, and we were at a book signing together, talking to each other, and that's how that came about. Um, and she had self-published that book too. Now, interestingly, the two self-published books were the ones that were critically acclaimed and more successful than the traditional one, which isn't to, um, you know, um, impugn traditional publishing. It just happened to be that in my case, you know, that experience I didn't like. And I didn't like it not because it was traditional. I didn't like it because I shouldn't have taken that deal I think my agent ill-advised me to take the deal. It wasn't the right fit of a publishing company for me. They didn't really care about my vision or style or, um, mm -hmm. you know, the way I wanted to present the book. They, they didn't really get me. It was like a bad fit. Um, and so the book was a disappointment to me. Um, and it was disappointing in its sales and all that. It just was, I didn't like that experience. The self-publishing experience was really interesting um, because we took the time and had the ability to make the book exactly what we wanted it to be, which was excellent. And it was excellent. It was endorsed by all these famous chefs. It was best of the year in the New York times by Florence Fabricant. Um, it was sold at Stone Barnes, Blue Hill at Stone Barnes, Dan Barber. It was sold at the Cooper Hewitt Museum. It was sold at MoMA the first year or two it came out. Um, it was a backlist title, meaning it was on the shelves for 10 years, which for a little book that was self-published was um, great. It was, I, I, I am super proud of that book. Um, Look for the people watching, what is it called? And so the the my most favorite book um, is called Notes on Cooking, A Short Guide to an Essential Craft. Um, my other book that really was technically first, like came out just before that one that was with the traditional publishing company that was kind of a bust, was called The Competent Cook. Um, and it has a very long subtitle, but the title was The Competent Cook. Mm -hmm. um, and then the children's book, um, which was a, one, I believe it was a mom's choice award or it was a award-winning book that was called, uh, that is called eat your breakfast or else about a little boy who his rocket ship almost crashes because he didn't fuel up his tank. You know, it's that kind of a cute thing for kids, little kids. Um, great book, great book. The woman who wrote that Jackie Jafarian broad is fantastic. She's a Colgate alumna like I am. And, uh, I did the recipes for her in the book and that was fun to be a part of. Um, but yeah, I, I, my goal is I have, I have about three more books in me too, that I'm really eager to get out. Um, and it's slow going, getting them out. Um, just because, you know, unfortunately book writing and chef work is not my number one job. My number one job is mom. So it's taking a long time, but I finally, um, I've had more book in me for a while now, and I finally have them kind of uh, mapped out and ready to go. And that that's exciting that that could be something that comes to fruition in the next couple of years. Yeah, it's great that you're still trying to make more books and whatnot. But moving on to the TV aspect of it. So was it like, I assume it was live, like reality kind of. So do you, did you feel more pressured like on air when you were cooking rather than if you're cooking a casual like thing for dinner for your family. It's very interesting. I, so I have done for myself in front of the camera, I have done uh, a ton of live cooking and my show was all recorded. So my, my 45 episode series on AOL was recorded. The post-production work on that was just as long or longer than the production work on that. Um, and that's, you know, the kind of thing you, it's not that you're starting and stopping and redoing, but you're starting and stopping, right? You're not really redoing. You got to move on. You have to get it right more or less the first time, but it's not live. Um, and you know that you're going to turn something that's an hour into seven minutes. And that's a different thing. The live stuff, it's interesting. I've been asked to cook competitively many times on TV. Um, it has never interested me. I have no interest in how can I make an order from Cheetos and Snickers with scallions and foie gras and soy sauce. Like I don't... I, you know, God bless the people who figure that out in 20 seconds. Like it just doesn't interest me. Um, so I've never done that. I have done a lot of live cooking on TV, whether it be on the news or on the view or, you know, like just, it's a six minute segment and 
that's what we've got. Um, interestingly, it's, it is stressful to a degree just because, you know, you know, millions of people are watching and you want it to be good. But ultimately, those six minutes of TV take about two to three days of planning. And I used to be um, on the other side all the time. I was a food stylist for celebrity chefs. So I used to be that person who spent the two to three days planning every detail to make those six minutes go well. So I would say personally, I had an advantage for that. Like I've, I, I, I know every side of what's happening. Um, and that, that has been an advantage in my own um, media career. Yeah, that's interesting because you watch like Chopped and whatnot and there's, they looked so frantic. So, I'll, so uh, it doesn't look like casually and the way you think we talked about food should be enjoyed in that kind of way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of like if you go in the backyard and kick the soccer ball around or throw the, you know, uh, baseball around or whatever and have a catch, that's fun. But if people are keeping score and there's a clock on you, you know, and you have yeah. like that, it's, it's a, it's no, it's competition is competition. Right. And um, mm -hmm. the artificial aspect of it, it can be fun to be given a basket and say, okay, you're going to get stuff in this basket and figure out what to cook with it. That is creatively fun and challenging to a degree. If it's fair game, if you know, the stuff in the basket's going to be, you know, um, like I say, Snickers and a Cheeto and like foie gras. I mean, I, you know, I'm sure there's some dust you could do with the Cheeto and you could, I would, maybe you're melting down the Snicker to make some kind of, you add vinegar, make a gastrique, some kind of sauce. Like I'm thinking about this right now, like, but it's, it's sitting out like who, I, I, you know, um, I find that kind of challenge. I get that kind of rush um, at the farmer's market, like not having a plan for what I'm going to make for dinner, but saying, Whatever the hell is in season, whatever's there at the market, I'll just come up with something on the fly. You know, that that's enough for me. <laughs> that's enough of a rush for me and a more productive one. Yeah. Whatever in my makes, life. Whatever makes you happy, I guess. Yep. And also, um, what is your favorite recipe to make? Or do you kind of try to do new ones every time or do you have a <laughs> well my kids definitely don't have to eat the same five things every week like a lot of people do in their family no my repertoire is hundreds of recipes big um but they do cycle through different favorites um and it's interesting when i think about what's my favorite thing to make in terms of the actual craft of cooking versus my favorite thing to serve because of how much it is loved by other people they're potentially two different things Mm -hmm. um, so there's all sorts of things that I kind of really enjoy making that aren't necessarily their favorite meals. Like I had this kick where, you know, you know, all these recipes are on my Instagram, on my website. I have a um, lamb bastilla, which is a Moroccan dish bastilla. And I use it, I do it with ground lamb. It's often made with uh, like shredded lamb or chicken in um, Morocco, but I do it with ground lamb and it's wrapped in phyllo dough and I do this beautiful sauce with it and braised lettuce. It's like very chefy. I just love, I love making it. They like eating it. They'll eat it. It's delicious. It's very beautiful. It's very, but it's just not, you know, they might be happier with lemon chicken with spinach and pine nut orzo and roasted carrots. That's like a favorite meal, you know? So which one do I enjoy more cooking? I mean, it's just kind of, I like cooking for the holidays. I like cooking for the oh, Jewish yeah. holidays and for Thanksgiving. That gives me a lot of, um, sense of continuity and really passing down, um, food memories, food culture. Um, I would say that's kind of my favorite time to cook. Um, but yeah, there's different things that stimulate me for different reasons. Yeah. There's definitely a difference between having a good comfort meal than trying to make something extravagant. Yes. It's still good. It's just different feel. But yeah, I'm sure the yeah. kids like all sor sorts of things because that you know, they do. Can't be picky if you're cooking for them. That I yes, it doesn't go over well when someone says I don't want that, and I'll make adjustments here and there. For example, when William, my youngest, was younger, um, he didn't want poke like Jonathan, Sean, and I. My son, husband, and I would eat poke, but my younger son was little. He no problem. From the poke, I would just stir fry it and make teriyaki. You know, mm -hmm. I would kind of use that base. It's not technically like a technical teriyaki recipe isn't exactly the same mix of what's in a poke marinade, but it's close enough that it works. 
Um, so I'd make those kinds of adjustments, but otherwise I don't. Yeah, I don't make it. I'm not making four different meals for four different people. No, that you have to, you have to like it, and they 99.9% of the time do. Yeah, and talking more about the farmers market, do you think you create your recipes by trial and error, or do you kind of base it off stuff that you've seen or wanted to try? That's such a good question. I do both, but I would argue that. I said, if I have to put a a value on it, I would say that more recipes are things that I've tasted something and I either want to try to replicate that in spirit or it triggers an idea in me and I go, oh, I can, you know, do something else with that. Sometimes though, out of thin air, I'll just see something, want to do something, never have seen it done before, which doesn't mean it hasn't been done before. It just means I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, But I would say it's more, I get a lot of inspiration. Let's put it this way. I get a lot of inspiration from eating as much as I do from just thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think any great writer, they all read. I mean, there's very few writers who are like, I don't read anything. I mean, they read a lot and they get certain ideas for either for concepts or certain sensibilities and flourishes and things come from consuming and digesting other people's excellent craft and artistry. And I feel that way too. I just, like for me, I try to cook once in a while, but when I do, I just kind of throw in stuff that I think would go well with it without really thinking about much of the, I, I follow like a baseline recipe, but do you think like seasoning, especially people can kind of use their own intuition or do you think you should stick to the books more, more well, often than not? I, my notes on cooking, my favorite book of mine um, is entirely about this. The thesis of the book is that a recipe is a roadmap. It teaches you where you're going, but it doesn't show you how to drive. So you have to understand when you read a recipe, I mean, so that I'll give you the long answer. The short answer is yes. I think you can put your own flair on it and you should. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. Um, not if you're baking a cake, not if you're dealing with pastry, uh, you need to sort of chemically follow that, Mm -hmm. you know, um, but in savory cooking, it's more alchemical. It's more about sensibilities and flair and finesse. Once a certain baseline of technique is down and you should add, you know, if something calls for half a teaspoon of ginger, but you love ginger. And by the way, you want to make it spicy too. do way more ginger and add some, Sriracha or whatever, you know, like that kind of thing. Yes, that is within you to absolutely do that. And it's expected. And the reason I feel so strongly about that, or I guess I would say what I can point to, to our, to demonstrate or illustrate um, why that is so is that a recipe really just is somebody's best effort of explaining what they did and trying to tell you how they did it. So I'm a pretty good storyteller. I know that people consider me a good storyteller. I'm funny and I'm good at the details. Fine. How many times you've been told the story by someone who's not that good of a storyteller? They left out the details. They didn't really tell you anything. It wasn't interesting. Okay. So you have to appreciate that when you are reading a recipe, not everybody's equally good at like writing recipes. They could be really good cooks, but they might not be good at communicating what they did to tell you how to do it. Um, And to that end alone, It's absolutely within your right and expectation for you to make that story your own, to take that set of, it's a roadmap, right? If you're learning to drive. So if somebody says to you, okay, here's a map of the Island of Manhattan. Now, when you get to the hill on Madison Avenue, balance the clutch and the brake in the stick shift car. Well, you would say, well, how is this map of Manhattan going to teach me how to do that? It isn't the same way that when someone says, stir the onions for 20 minutes or until soft and caramelized. Well, which instruction do I follow? 20 minutes or soft and caramelized? The answer is soft and caramelized, not 20 minutes. Um, but what about everything in between? Like, should I add some water when like the caramel starts to happen and it gets stuck to the pan? Should I lower the heat? What temperature should it be on? Like, that's the blanks that the recipe isn't telling you. That's that that particular, if it's written that way, it's not telling you all that detail. So when you get a recipe, um, I pride myself on being very good at putting in that level of detail. 
Um, but a, I once asked Jacques Pepin, who actually uh, is, you know, is one of the great French chefs ever. Um, and Jacques Pepin endorsed my, my book, Notes on Cooking. And I said to him once as a student many years ago, I said, chef, I made your pork this weekend, your uh, carré de porc, your pork loin. I said, and you know, I, and I was a student, I was so, I said, I, it, it said 35 minutes at 425, but it really wasn't done. It took me 42 minutes. And I, did you use a combi oven? Did you use a convection oven when you wrote that recipe? Why, why, uh, I was so stressed, you know, what did I do wrong that it didn't take it seven minutes more to get the correct internal temperature? And he said, I'll never forget it. I don't know. They tell me to put a time. I say 35 minutes. It's maybe it's 30 <laughs> minutes. It's 40 minutes. And I remember thinking like, yeah, you know, when Mario Batali says put two tablespoons, you ever watch Mario Batali pour a thing of oil in a pan? I mean, it's like he's pouring a half a cup of oil in a pan. He's, it, when you read the recipe, it says two tablespoons. It's not two tablespoons. He used like six. <laughs> so some of this is just not well written because it's hard for chefs to Really, unless they're going to truly do a proper, like, I've worked on cookbooks too. I've worked on Joy of Cooking, the most famous cookbook in American history. Um, and that keeps getting redone every 10 years. And I was a recipe tester for that for their 75th anniversary edition. And we tested all 1,000 pages. Wow. But that's like the most famous cookbook in the world where they hire a team of 10 of us to test all 1,000 pages over a year. Most recipes are really written from a general sense of what a chef knows to do. And then they're kind of giving you that general sense. And if people take it too literally, you really want to target the result more than the timing and the instructions. So long answer, but it's an interesting question. And I think one that a lot of home cooks don't really give themselves enough like uh, slack for, you know, that they yeah. should cut themselves a, a break. Like you're, you're putting a lot of faith in someone's ability to tell you what they did and give you the instructions to recreate it. They might not be brilliant at doing that even though the recipe that they are thinking of is really good. Yeah, I really like the idea of planning and cooking like a story, like literature. Because it's just, it, That's what it is. It is just someone telling you, I did this, this is how I made it, and this is what it should be in the end. Yeah, I think like, that's it's, a it's a way to think about it. Yeah. There's not one way you could do it. And I think, as you said, a lot of people, especially new cooks, try to stick to the recipe exactly and get like anxious about it. But when know. it's not pastry, I mean, if you're baking a cake, yeah. you've got it. Like a lot of people, even with a box cake, right? Which clearly I, I'm not an expert in making them, right? I haven't made them really since I'm a kid. Um, I make all my own stuff. But when you look at a box cake, it'll say, beat on high speed for two minutes. How many people just beat it until it's kind of combined? But there's a reason they're saying to beat it for two minutes. They want every single grain of sugar to be enrobed in fat. They want to create a certain amount of air interspersed throughout the batter so that the thing rises. That's why some cupcakes look like this, some look like this, some look like this. It's because some people are being literal with following those instructions and some people aren't. When you're working in pastry and baking, it's important to be literal. When you're working in the savory world, it is important to, it's more like jazz than classical music. It's okay to riff, but there is foundational technique and skill with any, you, you know. Undercook the chicken. That's right. But you can add some pizzazz to the sauce and the flirt, but right, there's a baseline of yeah. craft that has to be achieved. It's, I always used to say, because I was a figure skater, it's like figure skating. They all have at the Olympics, a foundation of like their edges, their skills, they can skate, but then it's the flourishes, the flair, the personal flair, the artistry that they add to it is expected and encouraged to be their own. Yeah. And on that note, for people that are aspiring to be cooks like yourself, do you think, what would you, what advice would you give to them? And would you, would you um, emphasize that point about adding your own flair in that sense? I think it depends how you're coming. Well, not depend. Some people come at this journey going right to culinary school nowadays. Um, that wasn't always the case historically. All the great French chefs worked in what was called the stage system, stage meaning internship in French. Um, and your 14 year old boy uh, from Lyon, like Daniel Boulou, you're shelling peas in a kitchen for a year and a half. One guy finally gets sick. Okay. They let you on the 
you know, let you pick up a knife, let you get on the heat, um, which is an interesting way to learn too. Um, I think applying your own flair is okay once you have mastered the craft. Unfortunately, what goes on too much today, in my opinion, because of the democratization of content, meaning that anyone can be a fashion stylist, anyone can be a chef, anyone's a writer. Like, I don't get on camera and say, I got dressed today. I picked out this headband. I chose this sweater. But like people are doing this, right? They're, they're all, everyone's a fashion stylist. Well, to that end, everyone's a chef. Well, not everyone's a chef. Um, chef means that you're running your own kitchen with your own recipes and your own team. Um, people making other people's recipes and doing it on camera doesn't make you a chef. You're cooking, but you're not necessarily a, you're not a chef. Um, all that being said, it's important to master the craft before you apply the artistry. Um, and again, I go back to that image of a figure skater. If you had someone or even a hockey skater, hockey skater is a great idea too. If you can't actually just do your crossovers and, and walk across the ice, which is what like crossovers front and back are for figure skaters and hockey skaters. If you can't do that with excellent edges and what like you, you have to master that you must walk before you start jogging. You can't be a great runner and not walk properly. It's just not possible. And that's true in cooking. So I think people should feel confident young chefs to uh, be themselves and be authentic to who they are. Um, but they also should not devalue learning sort of a historical or um, academic way to do something. I think that's devalued today. Everybody's all about the individual and, mm -hmm. you know, their own personal spirit and expression and all that's great, but it has to be built on a, on a strong foundation, not on a, not on stilts, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. I, um, I think that's very important, especially if you're trying to become a chef at a younger age, if you start younger than if kids just try to make their own recipes, it's probably not going to go well from the get go. It, it might. I mean, that's the funny thing about the alchemy of cooking. It might. Um, it's just, there is something to be said for, uh, you can deviate from a standard if you want, like you can say, well, I know the ratio, generally speaking for rice is two to one. I know that. I know that it's one cup of rice for every two cups of water, but you know, I'm doing the special thing. I'm going to do one and a half cups of coconut milk with the rice and it's going to be the, you know, fine, go ahead. It might taste delicious. It might be the best new thing. It might, but it's not great not to know what you're rejecting. <laughs> like it's better to, I, I personally am a proponent of people knowing what the standards are because the standards exist for a reason. Also in a kitchen, some of those standards are a form of language. If I say to another chef, uh, cut those peppers into Macedoine, Macedoine is a measurement. It's, it's a shape and a measurement. It's a specific size dice. If I say cut them in brunoise, they know if I want a brunoise of pepper, they're going to have to manicure the pepper. They're going to have to cut the pepper open, shave it down, get the ribs out, but then shave it further, cut very fine julienne, turn that julienne into dice. That's what a brunoise is. It's a very specific millimeter by millimeter size. Mm -hmm. um, and in classical cooking, that's a form of communication. I don't have to say, I'd like you to take the pepper and do, I can just say, yeah. do this. And they know what that's what that means. Um some of that is lost in the democratization of the content these days that is consumed by the masses and social media and stuff, um, which isn't the end of the world. But I think if one, if someone is getting into something by teaching themselves how to do it online, which is what so many people are becoming, they're learning how to make films online. They're learning how to build houses online, sew their own clothes online. It's incredible that one can do that, but it doesn't mean that. Um, it's the best way. Well, it, no, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't mean that they should avoid learning the foundations while doing it that way. Like they should find sources that can teach them some of the, you know, time tested things besides just the new finesse. Um, it can't be one or the other. It's, it should be a combination of the two. And that's a lucky thing about today. Um, it's just sometimes it's only the, only the fluff is, you know, considered, but it's, Foundations are stronger when they're built on solid ground. Um, and then you can get all decorative and fun once that happens. 
Well, thank you so much. We're out of time, but thank you so much for coming on. Thank and you. As always, what's your take? Thank you for listening to Harry's take. Thanks, Harry.